back to being due on, on well, starting to be due on Tuesday. They never have been because I was sick. So what's going to happen is this. The assignment that, that was uh, going to originally be due on Thursday will be due next Tuesday, one week from today. And in addition, though, of course, we're going to be doing new, new stuff. So it's going to be that along with another assignment that we're going to get into uh, today. But you will at least have a lot more time to finish the last one. Um, so what I'm going to do this week is here's the plan for the week, okay? Um, what we're going to do is finish up the binomial theorem stuff. Um, I'm going to talk about um, what I'm, specifically I think I'm going to do one of your homework problems for you in the binomial uh, theorem section. I'm going to give you an idea of kind of what you should be thinking about to, to, uh, when you work on the other problems. And then we're going to move on to section 2.2 and we're going to actually start talking about algebraic properties um, of integers. So we're really going to start digging into the number theory here. Um, and then on Thursday I'll finish that up. Um, we'll talk about some problems in the next section on Thursday and then that assignment then will be due in addition, as I said, to the one previously that was going to be due on Thursday. That, that new assignment in 2.2 will also be due on Tuesday. Okay? Okay. So, as I said, we, uh, we kinda, I kind of got stuck in the middle of the binomial theorem last time. So let's, let me just uh, get caught up here um, and kind of remind you where we were before. Let's see. Am I recording? Yes. Let's see here. Um, let me get, i got to click on this pen here. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we're just continuing section 1.2. And so you want to recall that um, we were trying to prove the binomial theorem. So this, of course, you have this in your notes already um, if you were here and you were paying attention. Um, so what we were trying to prove is this. Okay. All right. So if I remember, um, we I had established the base case of the induction here, right? So uh, I'm just going to kind of pick up where we left off. I don't want to waste a lot of more time writing down things I've already written down. But So prove the base case, and now we have to assume that the uh, binomial theorem is true for some natural number n, and we'll prove that it's true for, for n plus 1. Right? So let me just go straight into that. So now we're going to assume that this equation holds. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's just the binomial theorem. So a plus b to the n equals the sum from k equals 0 to n, n choose k, a to the n minus k times b to the k. Okay. okay? I just wanted to oh, sure. I understand. Uh, I understand that, yeah. Okay, I'll try to remember. If I, if I, <laughs> if I forget to, to read something, if something's not clear, just, just ask me and I'll clarify it. Okay, so we will assume that this holds for some natural number n. I'm not, just to save space here, um, I'm not going to actually write down what it is that we're going to try to prove. 
because I also I'm already going to be writing down a decent amount here. But of course, what we're trying to establish, and I'll go back to this here in a second, once once we do it, what we're trying to prove is that this holds four n plus one, right? So we're trying to prove then that a plus b to the n plus one equals the sum from k equals zero to n plus one, n plus one choose k, a to the n plus one minus k times b to the k. Right? That's what we're trying to establish. Is everybody with me on this? Okay. Okay, so let's just let's just go ahead and do that. Then Okay. So I'm just going to this is going to take a little bit of work, but we're just going to look at a plus b to the n plus 1 and see how to how to figure this out. a plus b to the n plus 1. Here's what I would encourage you to do. Don't worry so much about where these steps are coming from. Uh, a lot of times things that seem to come out of nowhere that seem really clever in mathematics are a result of just tinkering around with something and eventually seeing a pattern. You see the finished product. You don't see the elbow grease that went into it, but that's okay. You're not going to have to do something like this in the homework, but it, it, it would be good for you just to understand this and understand the technique. So my, what I want to encourage you to do is just try to understand all the steps that I'm going to take here, not so much where they came from. Okay. So... Um, I saw this a little bit in, in um, the homework. By the way, you'll get your homework back on Thursday. I'm spending a lot of time on the grading because I want to write a lot of comments to try to get you kind of squared away and, and going in the right direction here. But um, a plus b to the n plus 1. Okay. This is a plus b to the n times a plus b. Right? I don't think that's too hard. You add the exponents, right? You have the same base. You add the exponents. This a plus b is a plus b to the first. Uh, I did see a couple of you, um, a couple of you in here apparently uh, believe, I'm not trying to insult you, I'm just, I just want to get you squared away here, believe that a plus b to the n plus 1 is a plus b to the n plus a plus b. That is definitely not true, and that, that's a very bad error, okay? Um, so 2 cubed is 2 times 2 times 2, which is 2 times 2 times 2, right? You, you add the powers, okay? Um, so this is true. Now, let me, uh, okay, I'm going to go slowly. I want to go too slowly here. Let's just uh, distribute this. So this is the same thing as a plus b to the n times a plus a plus b to the n times b, right? You see what I did here? I just distributed, just treat a plus b to the n as a single term. Call it z, right? then that's ZA plus ZB. And so now what I'm going to do is bring the A and the B over to the other side. So this is A times, oops, sorry, A plus B to the N plus B times A plus B to the N. Okay, also pretty easy. Multiplication is commutative. We can definitely do this. Can we skip that? No, no. I mean, really, this, the step you would skip here would be this one, right. and just go straight to that. Okay. I, I'm just, I'm just doing it for clarity. Well, I'm just, I'm just doing this to, to dot every i and cross every t so that I don't lose anyone. That's, that's all. But yeah, in general, no. I, you wouldn't, you wouldn't list all. Those. I mean, a mathematician would know that you can go from here straight to here. But um, okay, so now we're going to use. The inductive hypothesis, which I'm, I'm not going to specifically write down, but I, I told you up here, right, that we're assuming that this holds, right? So a plus b to the n is equal to that. That's our inductive hypothesis. So I'm just going to replace the a plus b to the n, both of those occurrences, with that. With the summation. Yes, sorry. Yes, with the summation. Okay, so this is a times the sum from 0 to n, as k ranges from 0 to n, n choose k, a to the n minus k, b to the k, plus b times the same thing, right? The sum as k ranges from 0 to n, n choose k, a to the n minus k, b to the k. Okay, now, A is just a fixed constant. When I say constant, I mean it could be a real number, it could be a variable, but it's fixed, it's not moving. So this A 
we can actually pull inside the summation. And you should have learned about these kinds of things in calculus. Uh, you should, hopefully, you've, you've all seen these, these things before. But the constants on the outside, you can, you can throw inside. Just like with derivatives, right? You take, you know, the derivative of a constant times a function is just the same thing as the constant times the derivative of the function. So this, this property happens all the time in mathematics. And this is one of the instances where we can just throw them inside. So this is equal to the sum as k ranges from 0 to n. So what do we get when we do that? Well, we get n choose k. We might as well just write this as nicely as possible. This, uh, when, once we throw the a inside, we have a times a to the n minus k, which is a to the n minus k plus 1, right? Times b to the k plus, and then we'll do the same thing with the b, right? Okay. Sorry, this is a little bit messy. Okay, so everybody see what I did? I threw the A's and the B's inside. That just increased the powers of the A's and the B's by one. Okay? All right. So let me uh, make sure everybody has this down first. Unfortunately, with this, I have to go to a completely blank page here. But... Uh, Okay. Anybody still writing? I, I definitely don't want to go until you're, you've got all this down. Does everybody have this down now? Yes? Okay. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to use this Pascal's rule, which uh, I don't have time to go back and write down, but I'll, I'll tell you exactly when we're going to use it. So you might wonder why I'm doing what I'm doing in this next step. The, the, what I'm doing is I'm going to rearrange this just slightly so that we can apply Pascal's rule, and then that will enable us to finish the induction. Okay, so if you look, and then now you're going to have to just look at your, your notes here. Um, suppose that, I'll tell you what, let, let me go ahead and go back for, for a second. Look at this first, look at this first term here. Sum from k equals 0 to n, n choose k, a to the n minus k plus 1 times b to the k. Um, what happens if I plug in 0 for k everywhere inside here? The question is, what does this become? Okay, so what's n choose? Okay, let's just do it. I'm not going to write it down, but just think about it. What's n choose 0? It's n factorial over 0 factorial times n minus 0 factorial. So it's n factorial over 0 factorial times n factorial, which is 1. Okay? What does this become when I plug in 0? This becomes a to the n plus 1. What does this become? 1. So this whole thing, when I plug in 0 for k, this, this expression, this term right here, is just a to the n plus 1. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. And we're actually going to get to that here in a, in a minute. Except I have to do something, I have to tweak with it a little first. But yes, you can definitely do that. Okay. Now, um, the second question, well, let me, let me, I'll tell you what, let me just go through this. Let me, let me write this down first. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Okay. So this is equal to a to the n plus 1 plus the sum as k ranges from 1 to n, n choose k, a to the n minus k plus 1 times b to the k. Okay, plus, and I'll explain where this comes from in a second. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to take off the, the, the k equals 0, and we're going to just see what that additional term is, and we're going to add it on at the end. I'll, I'll explain this again as we, as we um, get closer to it. Uh, 
Okay, you know, this is where it's unfortunate that I had to cut off the last page, but um, this, is, this may look a little mysterious to you at first. Okay, I squeezed it in here. Um, all right, now here's where I'm going to have to say something. The rest of the proof is actually very, very straightforward. This is the part that you have to think about for, for a second. Um, if you understand this part, then the rest of it, we're, in fact, we're almost done. Um, so I'll wait till you have that copied down. And I want to explain where this is coming from. And I'll use the previous slide here in a second, but you're going to have to look at your notes once you copy this down because it's going to be confusing to toggle between the two every three seconds. Okay, does so everybody have this? You guys got this? Okay. So now we're, I'm just going to have you look at your notes for, for what we're about to do. Okay. Okay. So here is where we... Okay, I know this is a little bit messy here, but uh, here's where we were before. So what has changed? So here's, here was our last line right here, right here. So I told you that when we plugged in zero for K here, this became just A to the N plus one, right? So now, okay, I'm going to, I actually lied to you. I'm going to go, I'm going to keep doing this now just to confuse you as much as possible. <laughs> so you see what I did here? Just look at the first two. Okay. God, man, this is annoying. Okay. Just look at the first two expressions. I put these in parentheses for a reason, which I'll tell you later. But see what, what I did? See how this has changed? K equals 1 to n instead of k equals 0 to n. Okay, so we, we're missing the k equals 0 term. But the k equals 0 term, as I just said, is a to the n plus 1. So this taken together is just the sum from k equals 0 to n, which is what we had before. You see that? I just took the first one out, and then I just took the sum then from 1 to n. Okay? Now, what about this? Okay. Now, again, now I'm, I'm not going to go back now. I'm just going to have you look at your notes. But what, what's different now between this and the second term on the, uh, on the last line of the previous slide? Well, again, I'm starting with k equals 1 instead of k equals 0. You see that? Okay, but what I had on the previous slide was k equals 0 to n, the sum from k equals 0 to n, n choose k. But k was starting at 0. Now, because we're starting at 1, we've subtracted 1 to compensate. You see that? Yes, that's right. That's exactly right. So I had to subtract. Um, I had to sub subtract one uh, to compensate for the fact that we're going up by one, and that's why we have everything changed slightly because we've shifted down by one. All the k's now become k minus one from the previous line to compensate for that. You, you guys follow what I'm saying here? Okay. Since we started, at one, we, we were supposed to start at zero, so now we have to take the k's bound by one to, to, to get the same thing we had before. But notice, we are missing here, we are missing a term, right? The original expression was the sum from k equals zero to n, n choose k, blah, 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 right? But if we're starting from k equals one to n, n choose k minus one, what are we missing? We're missing the n choose n term. Okay, if you look at your notes, it was the sum from k equals 0 to n, n choose k. That was the first part of it, right? But by changing from k equals 1 to n, we've lost a term, right? From 0 to n, there's n plus 1 numbers between 0 to n, between 0 and n. From 1 to n, there's only n of them. We lost one of the terms. Which term did we lose? We lost the n choose n term. Okay? Notice that, right? No matter what I plug in for k, this will never be n choose n. You see that? We lost that. So we have to, like we did with the other expression, we have to add that on at the end so that we don't lose it. Does this make sense, sort of? Well, I hope it does. Um, that's where the b to the n plus 1 comes from. Okay? It's, if you go, I'll go back one slide here, and let, let me actually do that now. Okay, you see this? If you go back down here, what happens when you plug in n for k? That's one of the, the terms in the summation, right? It's n choose n, which is 1. You can check that. It's 1. Times a to the n minus n, which is also 1. Times b to the n plus 1. 
You see that? So we get, we get b to the n plus 1 when we plug in n for k. And that's exactly what we lost when we changed, oops, uh, what happened? Did it not save it or what? What's going on here? Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So that's the term that we lost when we changed the index set. Because we have one last term, so we have to add that one that we lost at the end. That's all I'm going to say. If you didn't get it yet, you're probably not going to for now. You can go back to the notes later and, and look at it. But, um, an n choose, yeah, so the, at the end, it's, it's actually the, the, the term that we lost was, um, I keep doing this, was n choose n, a to the n minus n, b to the n plus 1, which is just b to the n plus 1. That's the term that we lost by, by shifting in the index set. Okay. Yes? So on your second sum, from the line there, a to the n minus a, uh-huh. Is that the sum that you have? Uh, oh, on the on the very last slide, you mean the one after this? Yeah. The next one. Okay. Yeah. Oops. Okay. Right. Yes, because okay, because here's here's where it came from. A to the you're just talking about the a part, right? The a to the n minus k plus one. Okay. So remember from the previous slide, since we're we're changing from k equals zero to k equals one, we have to subtract one from k and all the occurrences of k. So instead of a to the n minus k, it's a to the n minus the quantity k minus 1, which becomes n minus k plus 1 when you distribute the negative. OK, good question. Is this, uh, any, any other questions I can help with? No? OK. OK, so now, um, as Joy, uh, Joe pointed out, we can um, we can actually use Pascal's rule here to get where we need to go. Okay, I have a question about that. Uh, Pascal's rule? Well, I have a question. Um, when, mm -hmm. I, when I said that you could use it, I thought it was because we had the n, the n choose k there. Mm -hmm. We had the pattern that ended up n choose k. But mm -hmm. now it's n choose k minus 1. So now right. I'm not sure. Ah, uh, yes. OK. I'm not sure that I see why you could Right. Gotcha. OK. No, no, that's fine. Um, I, will, I will try to make that clear once we, when we get to that point. OK. okay. So um, now what we can do, notice that we have the same bounds right, for on, on the sigma, right? k equals 1 to n, k equals 1 to n. So uh, as was suggested earlier, we can squeeze these into just one, one uh, sum, right? OK, so this just becomes <clears throat> the sum from 1 to n. And notice also. You see that what the terms next to the to the uh, binomial coefficients? On the first one, it's a to the n minus k plus one b to the k. On the second one, it's also a to the n minus k plus one b to the k. So we can actually just factor that out, basically, right? And then we end up with on the inside, this just becomes n choose k plus n choose k minus one. Put this in brackets here times a to the n minus k plus 1 times b to the k. OK, I'm going to put all of this in, in big parentheses here as well. You'll see why in a second. So we've got that. We've condensed that. And then we still have the plus b to the n plus 1 on the outside, right? OK, so all I did was combine, right? These two sums, they have the same indices. And I'm, so I can, just, I can just add what's inside together and form a single sum. And so now this is equal to a to the n plus 1 plus, OK, so I don't think I'll write the parentheses anymore. But the sum k equals 1 to n. And now I want you to look at this, what I, I have blocked off in these square brackets. If you go back. Um, to your notes from before, I gave you this lemma called Pascal's rule. If you might, might want to look that up now and see how this applies here. Pascal's rule said that if k and n are integers, there's a, it's important to check the hypothesis here. If k and n are integers and 1 is less than or equal to k is less than or equal to n, then n choose k plus n choose k minus 1, which is what we have right here, is equal to n plus 1 choose k. 
So does the hypothesis hold? Is it the case that k is between 1 and n? Well, yes, it is, because that's, why, that's part of the reason why we, we dumped off these other terms on the outside, is to make k be bigger than 0. So now the hypothesis for Pascal's rule is satisfied, so we can, we can apply the conclusion now. Yes, you did have it. No, yes, in other words, yeah. Okay, so this becomes just n plus 1, choose k. Let me go back here, sorry. Okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rewrite this because I, I wanted you to see that it actually does specifically satisfy the inductive, uh, or sorry, the conclusion that we need to prove, which is that the binomial theorem holds for n plus 1. n minus k plus 1 is certainly the same thing as n plus 1 minus k, right? No doubt about that. And actually, okay, I <laughs> keep going back and let me say, I am going to offset this so there's no confusion that the plus b belongs inside the su summation, which it doesn't. So plus b to the n plus 1. Okay. And this is by, I'm going to just put this in parentheses. I'm saying it now. I'm running out of room here. Pascal's rule is what allowed us to do this. Okay. Now, I, this will require a little bit of explanation, but because I, I, I tend to spend a lot more time than I should on these proofs, um, I'm just going to go ahead and write it out now. This is the sum as k goes from 0 to n plus 1, n plus 1 choose k, a to the n plus 1 minus k times b to the k. And this is, you can check this. If you go back to the original statement of the binomial theorem, this is exactly what you get when you replace n with n plus 1. So that is exactly what it is we're trying to prove in the inductive step. Why is this true? Well, notice what I do. So you see this is different, right? I mean, it, this was the sum from k equals 1 to n. Now I have the sum from k equals 0 to n plus 1. How did I do that? Why is that true? Well, what's the difference? I mean, this is, and I'm just going to say this, okay, because we're running out of time here. But look at this last expression. What is this? Well, this is just the sum from k equals 1 to n plus what we get when we plug in 0 and what we get when we plug in n plus 1. You see that? What do we get when we plug in 0? This is 1, a to the n plus 1, 1. It's a to the n plus 1. It's exactly that term. What do we get when we plug in n plus 1? 1, 1, b to the n plus 1. It's exactly that term. So these are equal. You can see because the first and the last terms are these guys, and then what you have in the middle is exactly this. So that's it. Now the proof is done. Okay. And here, this is something that's going to be uh, very useful to you in the exercises. So now I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what to do with the exercises. I'm sure some of you will appreciate kind of how to think about these. Um, I will tell you, and I didn't look at all the problems, but I, I think this is true. I hope this is true because if it's false, I don't, I don't feel really bad later. But um, okay, first of all, first of all the, the problems in this section in 1.2, it is not the case that you have to use induction for every problem. No. And I think, I'm pretty sure this is true, you're only going to be using induction when the book specifically says to use induction in the, in the directions. Otherwise, you should be able to do it without induction. Yes? So there's two things that I'll ask you. Let's say derive or prove. Mm -hmm. Those are both essentially the same. Yes. Okay. Yes. Definitely. So what I want to do, does everybody have this down now? Okay, so what I want to do now is actually, because we've been using the sigma notation, it kind of tends to maybe mask what's actually happening here. What I want to do is write out the binomial theorem without the sigma notation, actually just writing out all the terms with pluses between them. That will help you. If, you, if you've looked at the homework, and hopefully most of you have, you notice that a lot of the problems say prove that you know, some equation holds, and on the left side it's some binomial coefficient plus, 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 right? So that's just the binomial theorem, really. It's just written out instead of using the sigma notation. So, um, so this this actually will will help you. Um, so note expanded out. We 
we have. A plus B to the N is equal to N choose zero A to the N plus N choose one A to the N minus one times B plus N choose two A to the N minus two B squared I'm going to have to go over here now, plus on down to n choose n minus 1, a, b to the n minus 1, plus n choose n, b to the n. Is this some deep new theorem? No, it's not. This is just the, the binomial theorem, except remember what the si sigma notation means, right? The sum from k equals 0 to n means plug in 0 for k, see what you get. Plug in 1 for k, see what you get. Plug in 2 for k, see what you get, and then add them all up. That's, that's it. That's all you're, you're, you're doing here. So this is just sort of a less compact version of the same theorem. It's the same thing. Okay. Um, Here's what I will say. We'll, we'll, I'll probably say a little more about the homework on Thursday since you don't have to turn it in until Tuesday, so I'm not going to say a ton about it now. I will say something about um, 3A and 3, or sorry, um, let's see. <coughs> Let me say something about 3A and 3B. I think I gave you both of these, right? Oh, I gave you 3A and 3C. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm not gonna gonna do 3a. If you understand what's happening with 3b, 3a is even easier. So I'm gonna do 3b for you, okay? And then trust me, if you understand 3b, you will get 3a in about two lines. It's 3a is easy. It's extremely easy if you just see what you're supposed to do, okay? So let's look at 3b. And again, I know this isn't a hand-in problem, but I'm doing it just to help you with the other ones that are similar, okay? 3B says to prove this. N choose zero minus N choose one plus N choose two minus dot, dot, dot. You, so that just means you continue the pattern plus minus 1 to the n times n choose n equals 0. That's the problem, is to prove this. Here's the main idea, okay? You might, some of you might think, and you might be able to, you, you and if, actually if you're, you're, you know, skillful, you can do it by induction with just ignoring the binomial theorem and everything that we've already done. But then you're reinventing the wheel. There's just no reason to do that. Everything that's been proved in the section is certainly free game to be used unless it's specifically contradicted in the, in the directions for the, for the problems. Okay? So you might look at this and say, oh, I'll do it by induction. No, definitely don't do that. Um, you might look at this and go, ooh, that looks hard. <sighs> I don't know. This is just impossible. I'm just going to drink some beer and Watch how I met your mother. Um, that's not a bad idea, by the way, but not when you're doing the homework. Um, so, no, it's actually not hard at all. What you do is you just use the binomial theorem. And here's what you do. Here's what you do. If you look at, see, if you look at the binomial theorem written out this way, so you want to prove that, I'm just trying to give you an idea of how you go about reasoning this through. You want to prove that this is equal to zero. Well. This certainly sort of has the flavor of this expansion of the, uh, um, on the right side of the binomial theorem, right? It certainly does kind of look something like that. So maybe we can use the binomial theorem to just sort of get it for free. And then the question is, what do we use for a and b? Well, we want this to be zero, right? So in particular, a plus b to the n should also be zero. We want everything to be equal to zero. So 
what are the coefficients a and b? Well, what, what are some sort of natural choices that we can use for a and b that will give us zero, but will also give us something like, like this? We want all these things to collapse to one or minus one, right? Yeah. How about one and minus one? One and minus one. One and minus one. Yes, very good, for a and b. That's it. Done. That's the proof. Okay? You just use a binomial theorem with a being one and b being minus one, and I'll show you how it works. Okay? And I would like you to do something kind of like this. Okay, and I, so some of you are writing out um, more than you need to in your proofs. And I want you to notice that what I'm going to do is just going to proceed very succinctly from one side to the other. We want to prove that these two things are equal. So certainly if I can prove that zero equals this, then this equals zero, of course. Equality is so-called symmetric. If A equals B, then B equals A. So it doesn't matter which side you start on. <coughs> so just think about this, okay? So um, I'm, I'm not prefacing this by saying let n be an arbitrary natural number. That's technically what I would do in the beginning, but I'm trying to save a little bit of time here. Um, zero is certainly equal to one plus minus one to the n, right? Certainly true. One plus minus one is zero. Zero, zero to any power, right? Positive integer power is, is certainly still zero. No, no, no. But what, what I'm saying here, what, what I have in the, let me, let me just say exactly what's in the parentheses. One plus minus one, that whole quantity to the n, is the oh, same thing as zero to the n. I had negative you, Right, I thought, yeah. So it's, it's really just zero to the n is all it ends up being. I'm not contrary, I promise. No, 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 I, I, no, 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 I, I know. I'm just trying to make it clear. Um, and I'm not, yeah, sometimes I'm not being explicit here. So, okay, so really, and this is not really part of the proof. I'm doing this just to illustrate using the binomial theorem. Let's let, think of one as a and, and minus one as b, right, with the binomial theorem? You see that? Okay, so what do we get? We get n choose zero. I'm just going to go ahead and write the whole thing out here, even though you, you really don't need to do this. One to the n plus n choose one times one to the n minus one times b, which is minus 1, right, plus n choose 2, a is 1, right, so it's this 1 to the n minus 2, b is minus 1, so this becomes b squared is minus 1 squared, plus on down to n choose n minus 1, a is 1, b is minus 1, so this is minus 1 to the n minus 1, plus, and the final term is n choose n, b to the n, b is minus 1, so this is minus 1 to the n. Okay. Oh, sorry with the a here. This looks like this is 2 to the a. It's not. Here, let me block this off just to be, I hate this thing. Um, this is sitting by itself. Okay. So that 2 is minus 1 squared. Okay. Well, I know I'm going overkill here, but I just want to make sure everyone sees where I'm going with this. Well, what do we want this? What do we want zero to be? We want it to be equal to that, right? So let's just do the obvious rewrite here and say, okay, well, what's n choose zero times one to the n? Well, it doesn't matter what n is, right? This is still going to be n choose zero for sure, right? We're looking at the first term. This is certainly n choose zero. What about this second one? Well, one to the n minus one is still one times minus one. So the second term is just minus n choose one. Right, because we have a minus 1, this becomes minus 1 right here, right? And what about the next one? Well, okay, 1 to the n minus 2 is still 1, minus 1 squared is 1, so the next uh, expression is just n choose 2, plus n choose 2, right? Okay, so the next one technically is minus dot, dot, dot. And then what do we end up with at the very end? n choose n times minus 1 to the n, which of course is the same thing as minus 1 to the n times n choose n. Little box. Done. That's it. Do you want us to rewrite any of those? So for example, n choose 0. We know 
mm -hmm. oh sure sure um, you could you could do that but the only but what's being asked to be proved is just that it's uh, n choose zero minus n choose one plus n choose two oh, dot okay. dot dot so I'm just showing you that we can in fact get that okay. if you wanted to simplify more you certainly could but it's just not necessary because you have proven what it, explicitly what it was asked of you <laughs> you guys see what I did here you guys following seriously you guys following this yeah doesn't matter though but it's irrelevant whether it's even or odd just plays no role hmm? yeah 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 I understand what you're saying because you might say well I don't know what if this is positive one or minus one because I don't know what n is if it's odd or even but it doesn't matter because it's you're, you're not asked to know so it's just we've proven exactly what was asked of us done that's it okay any other questions about this all right so now, if you go back to 3a, it's even easier. It's, I mean, it's, there's nothing to it, really. a plus b to the n equals, now it's the same thing. What do we choose a to be? What do we choose b to be? In 3a, you wanted to get, I think what? You wanted to get uh, 2 to the n on the right side of the equation, I think, right? There's natural, well, let's see. Let me, let me open the book up here. Okay. Right, so, yeah, so, so for 3a, we want to prove that a, a, a sum of these binomial coefficients is equal to two, to 2 to the n. Well, what's 2 to the n? It's 1 plus 1 to the n. Then just apply the binomial theorem again, just like we just did. And it falls out right away. You're done. Okay, I'm not seeing a lot of expressions here. Does this, are you guys, seriously, if you have questions, really, I want you to ask me if you have questions here. Is this, is this easy? You guys getting it? Okay. So 3a, you should all get 3a now. All of you should get 3a. I'm doing this selfishly in part because I, it's much more pleasant for me to grade things that are right than things that are wrong, <laughs> especially with, and, I, and I, you will see, I am going to write a lot of comments on your, on your homework, which I think you should. you're going to give us all the test answers ahead of time so we can get you to grade it? Uh, no, <laughs> no, although you will see things on the test that you've certainly seen before. Well, damn. That's for sure. No, that's okay. What's, yeah, what's up? I have one major question. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And in order to solve that, we would <coughs> need to know that one plus two plus three plus dot 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 is equal to n times n plus one divided by two. Okay, so 5b. Okay. Um, I'll probably talk a little bit more about this on Thursday. Okay, but the point here is they give you a hint. Um, here's what I uh, request of you, or require of you probably if you want full credit. These problems where, they, where you're given hints, that hint, you're, I expect you to actually prove that hint. Don't just take it on faith. So your problem should be, whatever the hint is, prove that first, and then use it in the problem. Okay? They're giving you the hint, but that doesn't mean you get it for free. You, you need to prove it. And it shouldn't be hard to prove, really. So in this case for 5b, well, what's the hint? So m squared is 2 times m choose 2. Right? So what you can do is just replace all of these things um, and what you're going to get <laughs> let's see here um, yeah so here, here's here's what you're gonna do let me make sure that I assigned yes 5a I signed 5a you will probably find that you will use 5a in your uh, proof of 5b because once you apply the hint you're going to be able to extract a sum that is of the form of the left side of 5a. Correct. That's the. Like, it says using the proof we found in 5a. Yes. Okay. On top of that, there was another piece that he one plus two plus two plus blah, blah, blah. Oh, oh yeah, but I also assigned that too in one one. That was the first problem in one one. So, here's the thing. If you um, here's what you're allowed to use, uh, and there might be occasions where I'll assign a problem that actually uses a previous problem that I didn't actually assign also in the homework. You are allowed to use anything in the book, anything in the lecture, and any of the previous exercises to establish your proof. Okay? No, 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 no. So if you need to use, if you need to use the fact, okay. So if you guys remember this, you all did this in the homework. The, I think it was the very first problem I gave you. One plus two plus three on down to n is n times n plus one over two. If you need to use that in your proof, you can certainly just quote it and just say, by whatever it was, one a from one one, we know this. Okay? You don't have to reprove it again. Does that answer your question, Vince? Okay. 
You guys follow me here? Definitely anything you've done, you don't have to do it again. I'm not going to ask you to do that. All right. Um, I think for now, we'll talk a little more later, but for now I think I'm going to want to jump on to um, going on to the next section here. So remember, this isn't due till next Tuesday. Thursday I'll, I'll at least have a bit of time that we can talk a little more about this. Okay, but at least now you've gotten the section done and you have some idea of kind of how to start with some of these things. Okay, so we're going to skip section 2.1, which is just sort of a history lesson, essentially. Um, not that it's not interesting, but um, I, I'm not, in general, going to spend time on history because you can just read that yourself if you want to know. That's not really integral to the theory that we're going to be developing here. So we're going to jump ahead to section 2.2 now. Okay. So um, I'm going to try to um, get through the main theorem here. I think I can do it. Um, this one's going to be about as complicated as the binomial theorem, although its assertion is much easier. And you may just say, well, the theorem is just true because, duh, of course it's true. I learned this when I was in first grade. But, eh doesn't quite work that way anymore um, for us. You know, we're, we're interested in actual rigorous proofs. This is called, and this, this theorem, even though you learned it a long, long time ago, is extremely uh, useful <coughs> in elementary number theory. The division algorithm. Okay. You all learned, I'm, I'm not going to write this down because you, you all know this, but you learned a long time ago, hopefully, unless you started, everyone just uses calculators nowadays. I'm old, so I don't know. But I'm assuming at some point you learned how to do long division, 17 divided by 3. You learned this? I don't know if they still teach us or not. I hope they do. Um, so how do you do this? 17 divided by 3. Well, how, you know, 3 goes into 17, well, 5 times, and the remainder is 2, right? So 17 divided by 3, 3 goes into 17, 5 times, the remainder is 2. Notice that the remainder is less than what you divided by, right? Okay, because if it wasn't, if it was bigger, then you would go in at least one more time. Okay, so that's that's the idea behind the division algorithm. It's just formalizing this, and then we're actually going to prove this more rigorously now. Um, and it's going to look again a little bit more formal. But you'll remember that this is just stuff that you have already done, maybe ten, well, probably more than that, fifteen years ago, depending on how old you are, I guess. But um, so here's what I want to do today, if I can get through this. This, this is it. This is the section. It is the division algorithm. And this really just amounts to playing around with basic algebra, except there are a lot of, you can see a lot of letters floating in the proof, so it might make your head spin a little bit. But um, here is what it says. Given integers A and B with B bigger than zero, there exist Unique, I'll explain this more in a, in a minute. The proof theoretic <coughs> courses, sometimes it takes a while to wrap before you can really wrap your mind around what this word really means. Um, of course, you know what it is, really, exactly one. But how to invoke, how to apply this in proofs is not maybe as obvious. Okay, sorry. Unique integers Q and R satisfying okay, these two conditions. First condition is that A is equal to Q times B plus R. Um, I'll tell you how to think about this. Let these be suggestive. Assign some meaning to these things in your mind. Q is, the, is going to be the quotient and R is the remainder. That's, that's where these letters are coming from. Okay. 
And the second condition is that R is between 0 and B. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm going to split this, this proof into two parts. So here's the way you, okay, again, I want to give you some framework so that you understand kind of where this is coming from. Think of the, the 17 divided by 3 example, okay? So A is 17 and B is 3. Just think about dividing, okay? Then the quotient is 5, right? 17 is 3 times 5 plus 2, okay? And notice what the second condition says. It says that the remainder should be less than what you're dividing by, which, again, really does make sense because if it's bigger than what you're dividing by, we'll go into it more. So you'll have a different quotient. Okay. So, uh, all right, this is going to be, I'm just warning you now, this is going to be a little tedious, but um, this, will, this is good for you. Um, okay. Well, uh, I mean, it all depends on what you're allowed to do. I mean, in this course, we're kind of building up everything from ground zero here, from square one. So um, we're going to do, we're going to dot every I and cross every T here. Um, this, there are, there's certainly more than one proof here, but th this, even though it's a, a little long, I think, uh, clarity-wise, I think this is kind of one of the better ones, really. I mean, I really think this is about the best proof, because we have to start from the beginning. I can't say... Consider a Euclidean domain and a function which is multiplicative, and I, we're not going to do that. So we have, to, we have to do this from the very beginning. So, and I think this is a good proof. Okay. Um, so here, I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to split this into two pieces. Um, the first piece I'm going to call existence. What do I mean by existence? I mean, I'm just going to show you that there exists integers Q and R that satisfy 1 and 2. That's the all we're going to focus on first. The uniqueness we'll do later. Okay, so this may seem a little mysterious to you at first, but uh, you'll see where this comes from in a minute. S is equal to the set A minus XB, where X is an integer. And A minus XB is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. A and B, remember, are fixed. These are handed to us. A and B are integers, and B is positive. Those aren't moving around. Okay? What's moving here is the integer X. And so S is just going to be the set of all integers of the form A minus XB, where X is an integer, and this expression is bigger than or equal to 0. Yes. These are, yeah, everything inside here is, so X itself is, can be any integer, but we, we need A minus XB to be a non-negative integer. Okay. So here's the first claim. S is actually not empty. In other words, there's at least something in S. And this, if you think about what S is, this really shouldn't be hard to, you should be able to convince yourself of this pretty easily. I'm going to write a formal proof of this, but just think about what this is. A and B are fixed and B is positive. Okay? So we want, all, we, all we're looking for is to prove that there exists some X such that A minus XB is positive. Okay? Well, B is bigger than zero. So we can make XB as big in magnitude as we want by just multiplying by a really big integer X. Okay? So... If we multiply by a really big negative integer, then minus xb will be positive. So here's the idea. Take x to be some huge negative integer. The minus in the front then will make the whole thing positive because b is positive. So we can choose x big enough so that whatever a happens to be, when we add this, we get something that's bigger than or equal to zero. That's, you get, is that okay? I don't know. No, I feel like I've lost most of you already. Uh, well, but that's what we're trying to prove, though. 
We're trying to prove that there exists an x such that a minus xb is bigger than or equal to zero. Okay? It's not that hard. It's not that hard, really. Okay? Um, okay. Uh, all right. I'm, I'm going to just say this again. We don't know what a is. Just, you don't know what a is. It's some integer. Do you all believe that if you added a big enough integer to a, you're going to get something positive? Choose <laughs> x to be some big negative integer. Then minus x is going to be a big positive integer, multiplied by b, which is also positive. So we can make the minus x be huge, as big as we want, and positive. So if I make it big enough and positive, and I add it to a, I can make that whole thing positive. Ah, ah, yes. Okay, we're back. We're back. Okay, fantastic. Okay, sorry for wasting that five minutes, but uh, okay. Well, let's okay. Let's get back into this here. Um, okay. Well, let's see if you believe this. Minus whatever a is minus the absolute value of a is definitely an integer, right? <coughs> Certainly, that's true. Minus the absolute value of a. Yeah. Um, and. 
Okay, well let's just, let's look at this. A minus, okay, now this is going to get a little weird. Minus absolute value of A times B. Let me put a little dot here just to make sure that's clear. Okay, this is equal to, see if you believe this, this is equal to A plus <clears throat> absolute value of A times B. You guys buy that? Distribute the negative, right? Just becomes a plus. A plus absolute value of A times B. Okay. Since B is positive, remember that's our assumption. B is positive. What do we know? B is certainly bigger than or equal to 1, right? You buy that? Well, it's an integer. In general, if one half is bigger than zero, it's not bigger than or equal to one. But because it's an integer, it's bigger than or equal to one. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to have to go to another, another page here. Um, uh, you guys got this down? Okay. So... Now we're going to multiply the previous inequality through by the absolute value of A to get absolute value of A times B is bigger than or equal to the absolute value of A, right? So I should, maybe I should have just written this out explicitly. The previous inequality was just that B is bigger than or equal to 1. If you multiply both sides of B bigger than or equal to 1 by the absolute value of A, you get this, right? How do I know I can do that? Why is that a legal move? In general, you can't do that, right? I mean, there's situations where you have to change the inequality sign. Because the absolute value of A is not, you know, not necessarily positive, but not negative. Non-negative. And this is a, not a strict inequality. So, I mean, if A happen to be 0, then this is certainly true because it just asserts that 0 is bigger than or equal to 0, right? So... Um, so, thus, let's just put all this together now. A minus, minus absolute value of A times B equals A plus the absolute value of A times B. which is bigger than or equal to, okay, now you see what I'm doing here? Um, look at this previous inequality. I can certainly add whatever I want to both sides of an inequality. It doesn't matter what it is, right? So what if I add A to both sides of this inequality? You see, then this just becomes bigger than or equal to A plus absolute value of A. You see that? And the beauty of this is, well, what can we say? Think about this for a second. What can we say about A plus the absolute value of A? I know that's a very open-ended question, but it's, um, it's certainly big or, bigger or equal to, bigger than or equal to zero. Yes, Joe? Be equal to two times A? Not necessarily. It could be, well, okay, so yes, yeah, so the thing is if A is negative, suppose A was minus one, then A plus the absolute value of A is zero. So all, the, but but you can say for sure that a, whatever a is, okay, if it, if it's positive, if it's if it's if a is bigger than or equal to zero, then a, then the absolute value of a is a. Then a plus a is also bigger than or equal to zero. If a is less than zero, what's the absolute value of a? Minus a. You learned this in calculus a long time ago. So it's still greater than or equal to zero, regardless of what a is. This is definitely bigger than or equal to zero. Here's the the point. Here's the point. Absolute value of a is always bigger than or equal to a, for sure. Okay, and it's positive. So, 
and it's bigger than or equal to minus a as well. So this is bigger than or equal to zero for sure. You can do this by cases, whether a is bigger than or equal to zero or less than zero. I'm not going to do that, but that's certainly true. Okay, so what's the point here? Um, the point, if you look back in your, in your notes, is that if you looked at, at how we defined s, a minus minus absolute value of a times b is an element of s for sure. Sorry, this is a little sloppy, but uh, how do we know that it's an s? Well, look at how s was defined. Uh, I'll, if you if you miss this, I'll go back to it here in a second. But um, look at how. Uh, <laughs> whoops. Okay. Um, let's see what's going on here. Okay. Um, look at how s was defined. S is the set of all a minus x b, where x is an integer that are positive. A minus x b that are positive. What do we have? This is a minus, this is an integer right here, what I'm circling. This is certainly an integer times b. And it's, well, not negative, I should say. And it's non-negative. So therefore, by definition, it's an s. It's of the form a minus an integer times b, and it's bigger than or equal to zero. So it's an s. s is not empty. So what do we know about s? Well, um, here's the last thing I'm going to get to probably here. So um, by the well-ordering property, we talked about this a while ago, right? S has a smallest element. Okay, let's call it R. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to write two things down that we know about R, and then we'll, we'll probably stop, um, and then I'll finish this up on Thursday, and we'll do a few problems. Um, so this, the rest of the proof isn't going to take long, and that's the rest of the section. Then we'll do problems from this section and problems from the last section, then you'll have the homework on Tuesday. I think it'll work out pretty well. Okay, so here's what we know about R, and this is where we're going to leave off. Okay, so let's go back to the definition of, of S, right? It was everything of this form right here. And it's, we just showed it was not empty. So there exists some element R in S. So this element R has to look like this by definition of S. It has to be of that form. So the first thing that we know is that R is equal to A minus QB or some integer Q. Right? Just look at the definition of S. That's the definition of S. It's A minus something times B. So since R is in there, it has to be of the, it, by definition of that set, it's A minus something times B. We're just going to call that something Q. What's the second thing we know about R? There's one other thing that we know. Um, okay, sorry, before I do that, let's, let's rearrange this because we're going to use this here, well, on Thursday. So if you rearrange this equation, this is the same thing as saying that A is equal to QB plus R. You see that? 
You all buy that? Just by bringing it over to the other side? Notice that that's the quotient remainder form that we're, we're, we're interested in. That'll come into play in a minute. What's the other thing we know about R that we just found out about R? It's not negative, exactly. Remember, S has the smallest element called R. Remember the definition of S was everything of that certain form that was bigger than or equal to zero. That's in your notes. It's the things that are bigger than or equal to zero. Since R is in S, R is bigger than or equal to zero, right? Okay, so um, I think I will stop there. And uh, like I said, we'll, we'll do some one, two stuff, and we'll do some two, two stuff. The last thing, I'm, though, I'm, I am going to give you this. I think you'd, you would want to maybe get a head start on some of these things. Um, homework. So is this homework going to be due on Tuesday as well? Yes, yes. Both of, the, both of them will be due next Tuesday. Yep. But you've got a week. You've got a week. <laughs> two, three A, three B, eight and ten. Okay, so this is due Tuesday. What is that, the 12th? February 12th? Okay. So work hard, and uh, I'll try to get you prepared as well as possible on Thursday. And we'll